So um, I'm presenting neuropathology for uh, for this month. Um, I've got a couple of cases for you that are fairly interesting. Um, get started. This is a, a case of Dr. Wang's. It's a 70 year old male who's complaining of burning and ting tingling in the left anterior thigh for about three months. Um, he didn't do anything about it. Uh, symptoms progressed. Um, sorry. Uh, gr gradually over that time, and uh, eventually began complaining of weakness in his. Uh, left hip and then also in his knee. Um, he has a remote history of bladder cancer, which was treated in Venezuela and is allegedly in remission. He showed up to Jackson West with this uh, MRI scan. Um, I don't know if Turkey, do you want to tell us what you see? Okay, Eva, do you want to tell us? Uh, yeah, so looks like they're on the T2 on the left. Um, there is a or there's a contrast enhancing um, lesion that it looks like it's arising. It's uh, arising from uh, extradural, uh, extramedullary, and also involves the bone um, or the pedicle on and the vertebral body on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. So, that, and that's uh, five fourth L three, um, and like you said, it's contrast enhancing. Um, extradural, like you said, and then it really arising from the pedicle itself. You can see right kind of right here in this picture, it's, it's pretty obvious that this is the epicenter of where it's coming from. Um, and that was obviously my, actually my first question here. So uh, differential on that, Eva? Uh, so you said he had a history of what type of cancer? Cancer. Um, you said what? Bl bladder cancer. Oh, bladder. Oh, I mean, yeah, I guess. Could be Mets is the probably the highest on differential given his uh, history of cancer. Uh, the other, I guess, other uh, bone like lesions that metastasize the bone could be like um, sarcoma, probably. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Turkey's finally joined us, but maybe Turkey can tell us what what whether well, bladder well, cancer. Like, Turkey, can you tell us whether bladder cancer frequently goes to the bone or not? Was it a bladder or yes, bladder. prostate? No, he had he had a history of bladder cancer. I'm just yeah. I'm just asking Turkey because he's give him another chance to answer. Eva, do you care to help your friend? Oh yeah, so I guess um, bladder is that a, is that a is that a common metastasis to the to the to the spine? Uh, no, it's not usually. So prostate cancer usually metastasizes to the spine. Yeah. Um, okay. Very good. Um, and then surgical plan. I mean, what do you want to do? Should we just give up and call right on and have them deal with it? Or what do we do? Uh, Guy with progressive, progressive symptoms and now including weakness. Um, what else is here? Okay, Silva, what do you think? What's our, what's our surgical plan? Do you mind just going back to the imaging real quick? Um, yeah, it looks like it's, um, that's a weakness the on that left side. So I would do it. Yeah. It definitely needs, um, a decompression. So, uh, one or two level laminectomy at that level. And, um, depending on the degree of its stability caused by the decompression, um, may need some sort of, um, instrumentation as well. Okay. Very good. Okay. So let's, let's just move on. Um, so here's the surgery. What, what do you think they did here? Uh, looks like a, um, there's a lot you can tell from an x-ray. Uh, so. Looks like a one level laminectomy, um, in the middle of that construct, they put screws, um, uh, three levels. They skipped the level where it went, went into the pedicle on the, um, uh, on that, I guess, left side. 
Um, so yeah. yes, yeah. So yeah, it's a. We, they did a uh, L three laminectomy, like you said. You see the spinous process and the lamina nerve essentially missing here, and then the, the, the transpedicular decompression on that same side. Um, and of course, obviously, you can't put a screw there, so there's uh, there's only screw in uh, L three on on the one side. Okay, good. Um, Post op, the workup actually revealed uh, multiple other lesions. Um, and the patient was sent for radiation for the, for the, one of those lesions and then chemotherapy was going to be following, uh, the rest. And then from there, we'll go with, uh, Dr. Saad, let me, let me share here. Thank you. All right. So this is the uh, tumor at low magnification. You can see the paraspinal muscle. And this is the tumor. The blue cells, hyperchromatic, are the tumor cells. And here you can see they are infiltrating into the adjacent soft tissue, including skeletal muscle. Higher magnification, these are all plasma cells. How do we know that? So this is a very good cell at very good uh, section. So you have the nucleus that's pushed to the periphery, large cytoplasm, and there is what we call the perinuclear huff. There is like a sliver of clearing right between the nuclear and cytoplasmic border. And it is thought that this huff corresponds to the immunoglobulin being produced. And you can see the huff here as well. In pretty much every cell, there is uh, a little bit of clearing. To confirm that these are indeed plasma cells, we did CD138, which is diffusely positive. And now we did kappa lambda, and it turned out to be lambda restricted. So this is definitely a monoclonal population of plasma cells, which makes it a plasma cell neoplasm. The diagnosis of multiple myeloma requires additional uh, workup, including bone marrow biopsy and urine electrophoresis. Oops. One second here. Okay. So, um, yeah, as Dr. Saad was saying, this is a, a plasma cell neoplasm, um, and this is a, a population of a single clone of plasma cells where there's a production of uh, monoclonal uh, antibody protein. Um, the word plasmacytoma really is, is in reference to having a single lesion, which at the time of this person's diagnosis. Um, and actually, when I emailed Dr. Saad for the for the uh, pathology slides, uh, that that was the original diagnosis. But um, since that time, this patient's gotten a, the additional workup, like Dr. Saad was saying, and he's gotten a bone marrow biopsy, which is showing um, uh, uh, the myeloma in the bone marrow as well, um, and also multiple lesions throughout the spine. Um, you also see Kappa uh, Benz Jones protein in the urine, which is kind of a classic Bohr's thing, uh, light chain immunoglobulins. Um, and then the other thing is that this is a highly radiosensitive tumor. So part of the surgical planning in here in this case is that the patient's presenting with um, acute weakness um, for, and, and also canal compromise. Uh, somebody who's maybe who isn't that can be treated with radiation, which is why the other lesions in the thoracic spine and the cervical spine are being treated with radiation first rather than surgery. And here are just a couple other examples of um, uh, plasmacytomas, which you see in the skull, also in the spine. Um, again, these are single lesions, make, which is sort of how they are defined as, as plasmacytomas. Here's some pathology slides. These two on the left are just um, from other sources. And then the one on the right is the uh, one from this case. Uh, you can see the, the population of plasma cells. These are kind of, these are kind of a classic look for the boards also, um, seeing all these plasma cells that are all throughout this sample. Um, is, is really, and you can see it here on Dr. Saad's sample as well. It's, it's, it's uh, kind of a classic look. You see a single lesion uh, erosive like that. It's uh, definitely going to point you towards plasmacytoma. Okay, next case. Um, this is a 58-year-old uh, who was uh, found down after a seizure. Um, they didn't have any past medical history at the time, but ultimately it wasn't any, anything relative uh, or relevant, excuse me, um, after his post-ictal period, uh, he didn't have any deficits. And uh, so, Turkey, what do you want to do about that?
Turkey. Anybody? Uh, Victor Liu. Yep. What do you want to do about it? What do you, someone that comes in with a seizure, what do you do with them? Um, so, first of all, you, you want to make sure it's not precipitated by anything you can see on like a CBC, BMP, sodium, glucose. Make sure they're stable. Okay, so we treat their seizures. They're not, the guy's fine now. He's not having seizures. You get an EEG, and then we order what kind of scan? Uh, you, you would go for a CT first. Okay, perfect. And what do we see on the CT scan? You see this uh, intraventricular lesion, um, well circumscribed, no obvious hydrocephalus um, that I can see. Gotcha. Okay, very good. Perfect. Um, very good. No hemorrhage, obviously, and that's, that's another thing you want to wor uh, worry about. Um, and and massive hydrocephalus, given the location of lesion, which is by what? What struck? What? Why would you? Why would you be concerned about hydrocephalus? What? What could it be blocking? It's uh, the opening, uh, the communication to the third, the foramen of um, Monroe. That's right, Bert. Okay, so then we get an MRI scan, and why don't you talk us through this one? Um, okay, so we have a series of axial images. Uh, there's a, uh, it's mostly non-enhancing, with um, but there are heterogeneous, heterogeneous components of enhancement, well circumscribed um, in the um, primary left ventricle. There is no real associated edema. Um, so heterogeneously enhancing, well circumscribed lesion intraventricular lesion excellent okay good um yeah and you can see really on these other, on the axial and the sorry, sorry the uh, coronal and the sagittal uh how close it is to frame and row but obviously that there's no no real hydrocephalus um and like you've mentioned there's it's really only very small components of enhancement but generally a non non-enhancing heterogeneously enhancing lesion okay good uh i'll just kind of skip forward in the interest of time on this one but this person was taken for a resection by dr benveniste uh victor what type of technique do you think they used here there's, there's several ways to get to this tumor but what do you think was used here this looks like it's almost transcortical do you think it was do you think it was a big open transcortical uh no, section, no. or does it, does it, it does look, look more it. targeted than that yeah it looks it looks almost yeah it looks targeted yeah, so this they use the the brain pad or the Vicor, uh, I think on this one. Um, is it or is it, I can't remember which one they use. Maybe Jackson, but I think it's Vicor. But um, uh, yeah, this is they use the transsulcal approach. You can sort of see on this coronal image um, that there's this this nice sulcus right here, and they followed that down and then use the the Vicor to get down there. Um, could also use inner hemispheric in this case, but the, but this is actually a pretty pretty nice way to to kind of avoid the amount of a, a large amount of brain tissue. Um, by going transsulcal with the Vicor. Okay, so um, gross total resection, and we'll go to Dr. Saad. Hey, before that, Victor, what's your what's your differential? All right, well, it's coming up, Stephanie. I got I got plenty of stuff. Don't worry. Okay. So this is uh, you know one of the tumors that once you see, you recognize what it is. So at low magnification you can appreciate the presence of these nodules of cells. I'll show you in higher magnification in a second. And in between these nodules, the tissue is very hypo to acellular. So this is one of the features of subependymoma and higher magnification. You see the tumor is composed of ependymal cells. It's very important to note that there is no atypia, pleomorphism, or mitosis. And also the background is composed of neuropel. So this is a subependymoma grade one. Christian, you're muted. Thanks, Dr. Saad. Sorry. So, so Victor, what, what kind of lesions would look like that? I mean, I know that this is pretty cut and dry and, and um, with um, the pathology, but but name some things. With, with those types of things, um, maybe yeah, ependymoma, know that. ependymoma, central neurocytoma, possibly. Um, in addition to that, I, I think choroid plexus tumors also, but I don't think they would be as I think that would con, uh, enhance more as well as meningiomas as well. Yeah, right. So 
all good guesses. I think the one I think you didn't say was this one. Um, non enhanced, less en- less enhancement around the frame of Monroe. This is kind of a go to. And then, like you said, central neurocytoma. Um, a lot of people throw a pendomoma in there. A lot of people say core plexus tumor, but again, those are those are frequently more contrast avid and meningioma for sure. Core plexus tumors are notably extremely contrast avid. Um, so those are not really likely. And then the other thing is that you look at the location of these things. Um, so a, a pendomoma and a 50 something year old right there, kind of unlikely. Um, so it's, it's just it, the kind of whole picture here with a not, like I wrote up here, non-contrast avid intraventricular lesion near the frame of Monroe. It really points to these three. So let's just kind of go through some of those. So subependomoma is a grade one. They're slow growing. Um, they frequently associate with hydrocephalus. And a lot of them are monitored because they grow so slowly. Um, uh, but gross total resection is curative, just like in, in this case, essentially. Here's a couple of them. The one on the right is the one from this case. The one on the left is a different case. But you see they're remarkably similar, very little conscious enhancement. Um, and uh, again, the location is sort of key here. Um, here's some pathology slides. You see the one on the right is the one from this case. The one, other two are just samples. And the key, what, what is the key, uh, what is the pathognomonic description of this? Uh, Victor, I'll give it to you again. Uh, the the, the subependomomas. Yeah, there's, there's a phrase people use for this, this pattern of, uh, the, it's a non-scientific uh, description no, like, of what, no, pseudo rosettes. No, that's an append. That'd be more like a pendomoma. But the 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 description of this kind of a uh, histology is is islands of blue and a sea of pink. So mm-hmm. if you're looking for this, that's when when Doctor Saab put this up. I mean, this is like this immediately. This should just jump out of your in your mind. Is this is subependomoma? You see, there's this this neuropil, this pink neuropil background, and then you see these little islands of blue cells just everywhere. His his picture is actually the the most uh, cla- probably more classic than the ones I've even shown here. And you see, you see this big sea of pink and these little islands in blue. Um, Sega again, another is another possibility that's obvious that's associated with tuber sclerosis. There's these two genes that we need to know, um, TSC one and TSC two, um, you frequently see it in children and they have these ash leaf spots, which are named after these sleeves, um, from the ash tree. Uh, this is a chagrin patch. And then in the brain, you end up seeing subependomal giant cell astrocytomas. You see subependomal nodules, cortical tubers. And we'll look at some of that stuff now. So um, let's see who's here. Turkey. I don't know if you're here yet, but um, I don't know if you want to tell us what this is. Yeah, so uh, this seems to be more of a... Uh, as you mentioned, Sega. Mm-hmm. Good. And uh, what's this? What's next to that? So that's uh, cortical tubers. Mm-hmm. This one. These are. Uh, those are those are the subependomal nodules, and then the CT scan. They, they frequently are calcified, so that's that's all it's showing. It's the same thing. Um, and then here's a, here's a different, there's the pathology for that, for that type of tumor. Uh, so you can see that it's clearly an astrocytoma. You see the astrocytes here. Um, again, we'll go back to our original slide here and you can see that the, the similarities here kind of not really a little bit of conscious enhancement in various parts, but, but again, it's centered around the frame of Monroe. You could easily mix these two up if it weren't for the pathology. Um, and then the third thing on our differential is central neurocytoma, WHL grade two, um, you see it frequently attached to septum pellucidum. Um, it has this classic fried egg, fried, fried egg appearance um, and is mixed up often as oligodendroglioma, at least on the board examination. Um, but the difference between the two is the 1P19Q deletion, which you really see is classic for oligodendroglioma. And then uh, synaptophysin positivity is, is really classic for uh, central neurocytoma. So here you see two examples. One is very conscious enhancing, one is one is not, um, and then you have our, our key image from this, the case in the top right. So you can see that if, if you have a non-conscious enhancing one, that you can easily mix these two up, um, but they do come as either or of these two. 
And then the pathology slides, you, you see these big sh sheets of uh, a lot of blue cells, um, can very different from the islands, islands of pink and the sea of, uh, sorry, the islands of blue and a sea of pink um, that we saw before. Um, here is the uh, fried egg appearance as they uh, describe it. And I don't know, I'll ask Dr. Saad, I don't know, is this, uh, my understanding is this, this is actually a fixation artifact and that's why you don't see it all the time. Is that, is that true, Dr. That's Saad? Correct. Yes, that is correct. And that's why we don't see it at the time of frozen section. So this oh. is only seen on paraffin embedded tissue. Okay. Uh, and is that the same with oligodendroglioma as well? Yes, that's, the, okay. that's correct. Um, so here are two slides. I mean, I, I don't know, you have a hard time maybe telling the difference, um, but this is the central neurocytoma on the left and then an oligo on the right. Um, so you can see that they both give this fried egg appearance uh, on, the, on the pathology. And here we are with all three. Uh, who's here? Damien, why don't you tell us what number one is? There we go. Um, that looks like the pentamol we just talked about. Yeah, well, sub sub, 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 sorry, sub yeah. yeah. And then what's number two? Um, <clears throat> so the cells are too big. That's, that's a clue. Oh, um, Sega? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you see these these big astrocytes here. That's that's the, the real giveaway that this is not one of them. It's, they're not showing this low powered view. They're not they're not showing large sheets of blue cells. I mean, it's it's kind of all, and then the, this this kind of configuration of these astrocytes is is a real uh, classic for astrocytoma. Okay, and then the last one, central neurocytoma. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, good. Um, next hey, case, just, uh, Christian. I just uh, wanted to ask a question about the presentation in this case. But before I did, I wanted to give a, a shout out to Dr. Burks's paper from last year that, that was relevant to case number one, which was basically if someone doesn't have a history of cancer, and I know this guy did have bladder cancer, but bladder cancer doesn't go to bone, like you said, but if someone has no history of cancer and presents with a spinal met and a neurological deficit, there's over a 50% chance that it's going to be a plasma cytoma. It's the, the most common diagnosis of, uh, you know, uh, a spinal tumor coming to the ER with neurodeficit. And, and, and why it's important is, you know, we, we always say, you know, you shouldn't be operating on those patients because they're so chemo and radiation sensitive, but you're often forced into it because of the fact that they present with a neurodeficit or instability. For, for this case here, my question uh, was like, this, is, this guy presented with a, a seizure and he has an intraventricular tumor. And typically seizures are thought to be, you know, cortically induced epileptic genic activity. So how do you, how do you explain that? Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I mean, they are, they are coming from the, the uh, subependable lining. I, um, it's pretty, uh, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know. He doesn't have massive hydrocephalus to the point where he could induce a seizure, which is, is theoretically possible. Um, he, he's really a found, a case of someone being found down. Um, so I don't think we know for sure that he has a seizure. He just, that, that's just kind of the, the EMS story. Um, that, that's a good question. I, I, I don't, there's no obvious um, uh, uh, cortical lesion, like you said. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I'm not, we're not hundred percent certain he even had a seizure. Christian, it's, yes. hey, it's, go it's, back to the original MR scan. To the ependema at the floor of the frontal horn, and I wonder if it could have irritated the basal frontal lobe. Okay. You, Sorry, Dr. Rag, I think Dr. Rag asked me something as well. You see the, the flare image in the, in the lower yes. right of those four scans? Yes. So that, that periventricular flare change could be related to the tumor, or it could be he's had an obstructive the frame of Monroe became acutely ill, collapsed, and then it decompresses up with this same sort of scenario that people describe in colloid cysts where they'll have an event associated with intermittent obstruction of the frame. It's a big lesion. Yeah, okay. It, it could have had, it may not have been a seizure at all. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I guess that, that that that's probably likely because he we 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 don't we just hearing the EMS reports that he's posted like Dolan and stuff like that. That's the that was the kind of story before he came to um, I think Jackson North was prior to coming to GMH. Hey, hey Chris, if you remember the paradigm for the A and T DBS that we do for epilepsy, the projections for the amylothalamic tract into the circuit of Papes with the projections mm -hmm. to the singulum, they could mm -hmm. also be irritated when by this bottom part. Complex yeah. without the anterior thalamic nucleus. Yeah, yeah, as you as you're saying. Yeah, even even here you see it. Um, okay, let me go back to that. Oh, let's just sit right here. Okay, so uh, case number three. Uh, we have a 44 year old who presented with uh, to the PCP with uh, initially with neck tightness was given. Um, some uh, anti-spasmodics to help control net what was thought to be a neck spasm at that time. Uh, but then over time, this progressed to subjective weakness in the left deltoid and then uh, burning pain in the arm. Um, and then on examination, the patient had uh, just mild weakness in the deltoid and biceps, but had a, a positive Hoffman sign bilaterally. Um, so is Sumed here? Can Sumed tell us where they think the lesion might be? Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so this patient has signs of neuropathy with the Hoffman positivity. Um, what I would also say was with the left-sided four out of five left delt and biceps, I'd say maybe there's some eccentric. Uh, I would think that there's probably some uh, central cord, uh, you know, or rather something pushing on the cord, like a disc or something eccentric, maybe to the left at C5, 6, C6, 7, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. that's a reasonable guess. Maybe not central cord, but the rest of it. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean like central cord. Yeah, and and since this is neuropathology conference, probably not a disc, but also yeah. reasonable assumption. Uh, I unfortunately do not have a um, original preoperative image because I think they were on a disc at the time. Um, but uh, as obviously you see the the hardware that was put in here. Um, but Sumed, do you see anything that stands out at you? Maybe, maybe not. It's a little. It's a little bit different. So there's a there's a there is a lesion right here. I'll help you out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the original lesion went into the canal, sort of a little gotcha. bit like this. So um, let's keep going here. What do you think differential? Yeah. So with with that the with everything you said, kind of going into the canal, I'm thinking it's so like an extra medullary, um, extra dural extra medullary lesion, maybe like a schwannoma. Um, that could be arising from the nerve root over there, uh, neurofibroma, maybe that enters into, into the canal um, as well. I would, I would think of those kind of like the, that differential, particularly with extra medullary, extra dural lesions. Um, gotcha. Other modalities that could help with the, the diagnosis, um, you can do like a, you know, maybe like a brachial plexus imaging, you could maybe do like an EMG to see. Uh, I, I don't, I think an MRI is pretty, is, is pretty helpful. It was most helpful for this, particularly there's a, a mass lesion um, at that left-sided, uh, those foraminal levels. Okay. Um, so you, you want to take it out? I think it's causing symptoms. It's causing myelopathy. Um, I imagine that there was some sort of some cord compression. That's the reason why the patient had um, myelopathic symptoms as well. And I think given that, 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 that would be an indication for, for surgical intervention. Yeah. Okay. And do you think we should biopsy it first or no? I just wanted to add a couple of things in the history to make it a Sorry. little bit clear. Yeah. So, I mean, she presented with a lesion that involved the uh, four five foramen and had slight cord compression, very little, but uh, a significant extra dural component, which you see here that extended into the upper trunk of the plexus. And, and so it was mostly extra spinal, but the, you know, the thing about her that was very weird was that, she actually had pretty profound weakness. I, I want to say like her deltoid was like three or two. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and, and so it was, it was um, not your typical mild pain related weakness. And so that, that's what uh, caused us to, you, you know, say this might be something else other than a schwannoma or neurofibroma. So I guess the next question is if you have some diagnostic doubt about what it is, because of the weakness, what are the two things that you could do to help you before considering surgery, ruling in or ruling out something more aggressive? Yeah, I think with that, I, I would then maybe do a metastatic disease workup as well, 
Um, if, you know, the more something more insidious, uh, maybe like a metastasis from another source, um, uh, maybe a spectroscopy. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe like a PET scan. Yeah. CT. So, so a PET CT was done and it's the only lesion. So it's not a metastatic lesion. And it is, um, it, the SUV was like, I don't know, 12. It was, it was, is pretty high. Anything that's over six is going to be more on the, on the aggressive side. Um, if you look at the pre-op CT also, there was some, looked like there was some invasion of the bone as well. Uh, not, not like huge, but some invasion of the bone. So with that, what would you say is the next diagnostic test or thing that you should do prior to considering surgery? Well, um, I'd, I'd say, I guess you would, uh, you could, but before surgery, you know, like yeah. maybe like a, for example, like a biopsy, maybe like a, a like a fine needle aspiration of the, the lesion that's extra, uh, that's like within like the neck itself, as opposed to like close to the nerve. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's what we did at, we meaning Dr. Scheidewitz, who I got, again, shout out to him. These are not easy to biopsy. I mean, you have to do it under CT. You have to navigate the vertebral artery. Um, and he was able to, 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 to biopsy it. And maybe we can, we can look at the, the pathology. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to that really quick. So Sumat, just really quick, what, what, what's right here that would kind of, that you're worried about what, what yeah. there's, there's something completely missing. All this is missing on this side. What, what else is yeah. here that you can't see on the CT? For sure. I'd, I'd want to do like, I want to get an imaging of like the vert as well as on that side. Um, maybe like an angiogram. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is a, that's on the left side. And then this is, uh, I forget who did this, um, but um, they're injecting which side here? That's the, uh, it's the right vert. Yeah. Why are they injecting, injecting. the right? Why aren't they injecting the left vert? Uh, I would say that you kind of want to see, um, well, I, I guess I, I'd be concerned if that um, to inject the left vert, if there's any, uh, I don't know if you'd even get flow up there. It doesn't look like the, maybe there's like the entire, the mass is including the entire side, uh, the entire vert. Also, you'd want to see uh, if there's any back, like back filling from the right side. Um, uh, yeah, sort of. So, so what, what they're trying to assess here by do, we're just shooting the right vert is to see whether the, the poster circulation is, is being fed adequately by that one right side mm -hmm. so that they, that they, if they have to sacrifice the exactly. left vert. Yeah, then then you've got enough flow, which you see here. I mean, you see the pike is filling. You even see some some retrograde flow down the vert here on this side. Okay, and this person was taken for surgery. You see the vert actually did get sacrificed mm -hmm. on that side. Um, front back approach and tumor was resected. And I'll go to Doctor Saad. Okay, so this is the tumor at low magnification. It's a very cellular, solid tumor. Um, what we can see here at this magnification is that there is this vague fascicular or streaming of cells growth pattern. Higher magnification, so uh, there are no mitosis, no necrosis. The tumor cells are kind of oval to el elongated, and the background appears to be slightly fibrillary. As Dr. Levy said, the tumor, at least focally, involves the bone. So this is the bone. And here you can see a small foci of the tumor within the marrow cavity and also within the subcortical area of the bone. By immunostain, the tumor cells are, we did a lot of stains, but the only, the only marker that was positive is smooth muscle actin, which tells us that these are myofibroblasts. So we made the diagnosis of myofibroma, which is a benign, can be locally aggress aggressive soft tissue tumor. Yeah, I, so I just have finished. Like, so we, we got the, the, the CT guided biopsy. So we knew what it was before going in. Um, and, and so with that information, we knew that we wanted to be um, aggressive and take out as much tumor as possible. And that, that involved a, a posterior approach, removing as much as possible from the back, uh, seeing the vertebral artery and the coils, and fortunately it was coiled preoperatively, and then going anterior and, and going on both sides. Uh, I mean, 
doing the fusion, but then also going trans um, through the longest coli, essentially the lateral part of the longest coli to, to resect the sort of portion that extended into the upper, upper trunk. Okay. Yeah. So, um, let's put my mic on. Just make sure. Um, we uh, so this is my fibroma, as Dr. Saad mentioned. Um, it's a proliferation of uh, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, and it's locally aggressive. Um, interesting. It has a kind of a biphasic pattern of spindle cells, um, and is frequently seen in younger children. Um, there's usually a painless growing mass, and they're usually solitary. But there are there is a entity of myo, myofibromatosis where, where uh, children especially will present with multiple lesions. Um, here I've shown, there are two different things here. This one at the top is the image from the from Dr. Saad, and you see that biphasic pattern. Uh, my favorite ones are notably uh, SMA positive, but they're S100 negative. Um, like Dr. Saad said, they run probably multiple stains. Um, I, can't, I probably don't even know half the names of those stains, but the, the key one here is uh, this is S100 negative, and this is a, uh, down here is a schwannoma, and you can sort of see that the differences, but also the similarities between the two and how just the single immunostain is gonna make a huge difference in the diagnosis. Um, uh, what else do I have to add about that? Uh, but I get, to get back to what Sumed said about the about his, his differential, uh, you know, schwannoma would, would probably would be high up in the, in the differential, except for the, the bony invasion, the bony erosion, um, and then the amount of weakness that the patient was presenting with, um, as Dr. Levy mentioned. Okay, last case. Um, this is a 56-year-old who uh, presented with uh, left-sided facial numbness, um, has a history of myosin and gravis, um, and also had a prior craniotomy for in 2012 for a brain tumor. Um, I'm simplifying the story a little bit for the purposes of the, the conference, but um, she had uh, presented with sensory loss over the entire left hemiface um, from V1 to V3. And uh, this CT scan. Um, so Davik, are you there? What, do you want to tell us if you see anything unusual? Is Davik here? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, okay, why don't you, what's that? Why don't you tell us, start with that. Tell us what that is. So that. That's the normal thing. That's a normal thing. So. Yeah. Is that the uh, roof of the maxillary sinus? No, the whole, I'm talking about the hole, the, the, the hole oh, that's there oh, in the bone, this. Uh, it's the, oh, is that's the foramen rotundum? Uh, close, it's foramen of valley, um, but you, and you see it on the axle here, so then that is what? So that would be sphenoid wing? Uh, no, this, this here, it's kind of hard because it's cut in cross section, but this is, this is foramen uh, rotundum. Oh. And then, the, then next to those two is. Uh, um. uh, let's see, uh, Victor, do you want to, you care to help him out? Spinoza. Yes. Very good. Okay, good. And then, so the obvious thing is why does this look different? Um, so we'll go to the MRI scan and um, let's see, who can we go to? Uh, Damien, why don't you tell us what you see? So there is a contrast enhancing lesion. Uh, looks like kind of in the left sort of lateral cavernous sinus, Meckel's cave area. Uh, a, looks like a cystic component in the center as well. Um, yeah. Does that help at all? Uh, it also extends pretty far anteriorly as well. <clears throat> Is it confined um, to the intracranial vault or no? Uh, no, it looks like it goes also inferiorly down into, uh, um, so like extracranially, like inferiorly through. Uh, so, dif yeah, what, what's your differential there. on that? Um, 
facial numbness, lesion. Yeah, I mean, like, like going a, through a foramen. Yeah, I mean, it could be like a, a trigeminal schwannoma given its location, or something more malignant, like a um, uh, I'm blanking on the name. All right, we'll get there. We'll, we'll hold that yeah. thought. We'll get back. We'll get back to that. Let's go to let's go to Doctor Saad because this was uh, Doctor Morgos took this to surgery and uh, sent the sample to pathology. Okay, so this is not an easy one. I'll, um, so this is at low magnification. This is the schwannoma component of the tumor. So um, by now you guys have seen so many schwannomas and schwannomas, you, we talk about very okay body, Anthony A, Anthony B, we just showed, Christian just showed us a case of schwannoma. Here, this is a red flag, although it is a schwannoma, which we demonstrated by immunostains, uh, it doesn't show the classic features of schwannoma, which, uh, which is a red flag by itself. And this is what, why we know it's schwannoma because it's, it's 100 positive. And here you can see the strong and diffuse positivity. However, if you look carefully, you start to see areas that are not positive. They're not picking up the stain. So what's going on here? This is higher magnification of those areas. And you start to see these cells that are uh, hyperchromatic, meaning they contain a lot of uh, chromatin, they're large, some of them are multinucleated, and they stand out in the background where, where the Schwann cells are present, which are elongated, slightly spindle cells, hypochromatic, with no ATP and epimorphism. So we have foci of worrisome uh, cytologic features in a background of Schwannoma. And indeed, when we did the KI67, which is a proliferation marker, in the schwannoma, the KI67 is very low. However, in the focus that I just showed you, the KI67 is quite high. It approaches about 11 to 12%. So here we suspected that there is trans malignant transformation of this schwannoma. So schwannoma is a peripheral nerve sheath tumor and its malignant counterpart is called malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, which is MPNST for short. And there is a very good stain for, uh, for MPNST and this stain as opposed to the majority of immunostains that we use, uh, it is when it is lost, it is positive. So we don't talk about positivity or negativity of H3, K27, and E3. We, we talk about whether it's retained or lost. So it is normally retained. So this is the schwannoma and you can see the stain is retained at the nuclei and this is a benign uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumor while the malignant uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumor cells are lost, uh, the, the staining is lost. So we there is definite um, MPNST uh, differentiation arising in H1 normal. Okay, so yeah, definitely an interesting case. Um, so uh, we, you know, we sort of talked about the differential already, but uh, as Demi mentioned, schwannoma, and then anytime that comes up, you need to also throw this in here, MPNST, which is what it, this ended up being. She had a prior resection, I think in 2012, was lost to follow up. Uh, I think she lives in the islands, was the kind of story. Um, and the original pathology, I think, was just a just a classic schwannoma. But then as she represented um, with this larger lesion, this this it, it demonstrated these MPNST features, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, although this lesion doesn't look at look quite like it, if you see smaller lesions that are conscious enhancing in this location, you know meningioma maybe. But again, this one's this one's not. This one's heterogeneously conscious enhancing. Uh, it's also following along a, a foramen, a kind of unclassic to meningioma. There's no hyperostosis of the bone. Um, if you have got meningioma on there, these are the kind of things you worry about um, also with your, with your differential. Um, and I'll go back to this slide here because this is really kind of the key slide for the, to, as I forget who, who I was asking at the time, but you see frame of valley or, or, or combination of uh, ovalian rotundum that has been basically blown out by this, by this tumor. Um, 
And schwannomas kind of have this classic dumbbell appearance because they follow along the nerves and they, they expand foramina, which is how that happened in the skull. Here's some examples. Um, you see them, this one going out the spine here, you've got one, an intracranial one, but they, they've got this, this very classic dumbbell appearance. This one even has that heterogeneous conscious enhancement of the, of the actual case. They're associated with uh, neurofibromatosis, uh, but are frequently also sporadic. Um, I'll just go through some of the classical features that uh, Dr. Saad touched on just to remind everybody. Uh, so the Antony A and B fibers are the two kind of classic picture of, of, um, of Schwannoma, and I'll show them in a second, as also the Veruque bodies. Um, here you see the two, the tightly packed Antony A and the loosely packed Antony B. And then here you have the Veruque bodies, which you see is they look like uh, essentially schools of fish swimming around in the ocean. Um, um, this lesion, of course, is the MPNST. Uh, I've got a couple of different uh, slides up here. The one on the top right, the smallest one is, is an actual schwannoma, but you see that there, that pattern is not the same as, as the MPNST, uh, which as Dr. Saad mentioned is a red flag in itself. And then there's, uh, I was reading in my pathology book that there's this, and I showed this last time, the marbling pattern on the low pattern. I, I don't know how much Dr. Saad, I don't know how much, does that help you a lot at all in, in diagnosis or no? Well, the, the, the smaller picture that you're showing appears to be a classic schwannoma with Anthony yeah. B, Anthony B. And the rest of it is, is worrisome, appears to be spindle cell malignant neoplasm, likely M, 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 MPNST. But the, well, my question is, does this, does this marbling, um, that, that, that's what I was reading, was that the marbling is, is like a, a pathologic feature of, of, of MPNST or, or, or is it not so cut and dry? <laughs> It's it's not it's not characteristic, you know. With, okay. uh, you know, MPNST basically is a sarcoma. It can it can present in so many ways. I see. Okay. Um, here I've got a, the, a couple of pictures. Again, this is the schwannoma up top. You see the the one, a picture from a, a different source of MPNST, and then you see our, our our case here, and you see the similarities between the the two of the MPNST and then uh, the schwannoma. Um, and, and that's it for today.